Hi, it's Jen Taub. Welcome back to Booked Up, a podcast that features you, me, and our favorite authors. We release a new episode every Sunday morning. Today, my guest is Brandon Wolf, author of the memoir, A Place for Us. Brandon is a survivor of the 2016 domestic terror attack at the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, Florida, where his best friends and 47 others were murdered. Brandon has honored the victims' legacies with action, advocating for LGBTQ plus civil rights and gun safety reform. Today, Brandon is the press secretary for Equality Florida. I was incredibly moved by Brandon's memoir, as were so many others. Here's just one expression of glowing praise for A Place for Us. Joy Reid, host of The Readout, said, One of the most powerful voices of his generation, Brandon Wolf tells a story of race, place, and the struggle for belonging that will drive you to tears and expand your capacity for hope, as well as your appreciation for the power of community. A true inspiration. You may also know Brandon from his newspaper opinion pieces and as a contributor on MSNBC's The Readout and on American Voices with Alicia Menendez. Okay, let's dive in. Hi. Hey, how are you, Jen? I'm good. Where are you right now? Uh, Home in Orlando. Is that like a satellite dish in the corner of your living room? (laughs) No, it's a lamp I ordered from some like bizarre place where you can find weird modern furniture. I loved Uh it. And so I ordered it. It's really cool. So it looks almost like a solar system or like an eye staring at you. Yeah, exactly. Is that the look you're going for? I guess we're going for that look. (laughs) And uh, so you're home. Have you been out and about with uh, the book? I have. So I've done, uh, I did an event in D.C. I did an event in Richmond. Uh, We are in the final stages of planning our event here in Orlando. And then we'll see where else the journey takes me. We may end up in Tampa. Uh, There's a group back home at my hometown that wants to do an event. We may join them. So... Hometown, meaning Oregon? In yeah. Oregon? Yeah. So what is it going to be like to do an event in Orlando, do you think, uh, with everybody rem- you know, remembering? I mean, I know it's b- b- just recently been an anniversary, so. Yeah, I think that um, the Orlando community really wants an event. They really want an opportunity to celebrate. I know they're very proud. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I think that will probably feel like a homecoming for me. The D.C. event was great. I have a lot of friends in D.C. It was pretty political in nature, but I think the Orlando event will just, you know, be like hanging out with friends. Where was the D.C. event? Uh, It was at the Center for American Progress. Oh, cool. Yeah, it was uh, moderated by Chastin Buttigieg. It was a great conversation. Had you met him before? I have. We actually became good friends um, during the presidential election cycle. Um, Although I was a Warren stan at the time, we still built a bond. And uh, yeah, that was my gal. Uh, I'm, I'm so, clapping. I'm cl- people can't see me clapping, but I was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, um, it was great to connect with him on the trail and, and, you know, just to have other like queer people on that trail. So mm-hmm. he came to Orlando. We spent some time uh, at Pulse Nightclub itself. I took him on a, a little tour to pay his respects and we stayed close. And so when I decided to write a book. He's actually one of the first people I called and said, oh my God, how do I write a book? <laughs> was his advice on structure or was his advice more on like staying calm and keeping at it? All of the above. His <laughs> advice was, his, the best advice he gave me was about how to set up my space to create. Um, oh. you know, he talked about like nesting at home and figuring out what time of day you write best and, and you know, do you do little increments of time? Do you sit down and write for four hours and then leave it alone for a day or two? He really helped me with my process. And I think he also helped me feel confident in owning my process, right? That there's mm-hmm. no one right way to do it. You have to figure out what makes the most sense for you. He was really good at helping me discover how I write books best. Um, and Can and, I have and, his phone number? Because I need help. <laughs> I'm sure he would be happy to help you. Yeah, he, <laughs> He was so generous with his time and his insights. And he talked a lot about how, um, you know, Mayor Pete writes one particular way and he writes a different way and how they would be on the trail together and, and sort of like 
figuring out how to write books simultaneously. It was, it was cool to have that kind of mentorship. So I want to ask you then about um, the things that you just mentioned. You mentioned time of the day, whether you write in increments, small increments or big chunks, um, and kind of nesting. What did you, have you discovered anything about your process that you want to share on those aspects? Yeah, so my boss is really supportive and she actually gave me a significant amount of time off at the beginning of this process to start writing. Um, One of the first pieces of advice I got, another person I called was um, Joy Reid, who is a a host on MSNBC. I've heard of her. Yeah, you might have heard of her before. She sounds familiar. Maybe had a radio show or something first. Maybe somewhere. You passed her in a bar one time. It's 7 Um, o'clock. The name comes to mind, but I don't know why. Yeah, maybe. It's like ingrained in you. It's a habit Uh. now. (laughs) Um, So Joy is a good friend, and she also is one of the people who convinced me to write a book. So Mm -hmm. when I first got offered a deal to write it, I called her and also asked, what is your process like? How do you write a book best? And she, the best piece of advice she gave me was to take time. You can't just try to squeeze it in on the weekends or after work. You really need to build time to figure out your process and to dive into what it looks like to write a book. So um, I approached my boss and said, hey, I just signed this contract. I would love your support. And she said, take as much time as you need. So I really took six to eight weeks off of work to begin writing the book. Mm -hmm. I moved to Mexico actually uh, during that time and like got an apartment by the beach. And it was that process of separating myself from my environment, of getting out of the sort of day-to-day grind and also just the the continued grief of being in a community that's been impacted by gun violence and where I lost my friends. I think getting out of that space was the most important part of my process. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, I learned, you know, I write best uh, like mid-morning, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. I don't do well if I have to sit for hours and hours at a time. I like to do little spurts. Um, What is a little spurt for you? 40 minutes or is a little spurt five minutes? No, I would go for an hour. I would give myself an hour. That's actually a good, that's a good amount of writing. Yeah, I would say, okay, if I can do one hour, then I get a break. I get to do something fun. And so I would sit down for an hour you know, hammer out whatever I needed to hammer out. I would really challenge myself not to begin self-editing halfway through that either because the temptation, right, as a writer is like, you start writing and you get in your head and you're like, oh, is that accurate? Will people like that I said that? How will they perceive these words? Did I use that word too often? So um, I really (laughs) challenged myself in that one hour, like, don't get stuck editing just right for an hour and then take a break and come back to it. I I love all this advice, and I especially like um, that everyone has their own process. And I remember when I wrote my my first book, which is always, I think, the hardest. I mean, they're all hard, but I think the first because, you know, you think, what if I never, I'm given the shot. I got the shot, and what if I can't do it? Um, And my, my, my husband said, trust the process. And I know that sounds like a cliche, but that's, my process was very messy and sometimes still is, but when I trust it, there's that payoff, you know, because things happen and they work in a certain way. And, you know, I think that's really, I think it's really good. And thank you for sharing uh, what you do. You're now in a different phase though, because right. it's really scary when the book first came, comes out and yours just, just did. Um, yeah. And you have no control anymore. That's right. It is really scary <laughs> and it's really vulnerable. And you go through all the range of emotions. I'm glad that my Uh, publishing team and the PR team have been here before because I'm probably driving them, you know, absolutely wild with all of the emails and calls and text messages. But um, yay, I see the book. I'm I'm just so, I'm thrilled with it. I'm honestly really proud of it. I am honored that I get to share this story. It is a terrifying time when you put it out in the world. First of all, you're not sure anyone will read it at all. And then you're, you know, you're worried if they do read it, what will they think? Um, Yes. But it just has been a really rewarding process to get the words on the page, to hear feedback from my trusted circle, from my parents, from my friends, and then to watch people respond to the book and resonate with different parts of it. It, It's truly um, one of the most rewarding journeys I think I've ever been on. Isn't it amazing when you like think back in your mind of maybe when you were writing at the beach or back inside where you were renting on paper or on the computer, whatever it was you were doing, isn't it amazing that it's actually fixed as a thing on the shelf? It's pheno- it is, it's a phenomenon, right? It's really it's like when you're in the middle of the process, you can't imagine it coming together, right? It's still such a mash of stories and 
you know, I am a very, I'm an operationalist by nature. I'm not really a creative. And so I think about things linear and I think about structure and I do all of that sort of thing. Um, and so for me, I tried to start writing the book in linear fashion, right? You start at the beginning and you work to the end. And yeah, somewhere no. along the way, <laughs> somewhere, <laughs> yeah, somewhere along the way, you, you just can't do that anymore, right? Stories pop out and you have to go back and work on things. And the editing process throws all of that for a loop because the editors are working on different things at different times. And so a little bit was letting go of that sense of control. But when you're in the midst of that chaos, especially for me as a type A operationalist, I'm like, this is never going to come together. It's never going to make sense on paper. And then you get that first, you know, author copy and, and you read it from front to back. And it's just, it is mind blowing. I was very emotional. I cried a lot when I got yeah. the first when physical the box, copies. The when box the box shows in. up. Yeah. It came in like a week or two before Christmas. So it felt like a Christmas present. It just, everything about it was so rewarding. You know, it's so funny because the, the, the second book I wrote, when the box came in, it was like in the evening and I was really exhausted. I didn't open it. I want to wait till I could be in the right frame of mind. Right. <laughs> but I want to talk to you about the outside of your book, which is, yeah. I, you know, I love the cover design, but I also love how it feels. Did you, Thank did they you. tell you it was going to feel this way? Like kind of like a little rough, but then also smooth where the heart is? We talked a little bit about texture. So one of the things I had to get comfortable with was relinquishing control of some of the creative process. You get, you know, you get a lot of input on what you want the cover to look like. You get the final yes or no on whether or not you like it. But it's sort of up to the partnership you create with the artist. And the artist for this cover is Rex Bonamelli. He's done a ton of book covers before. He's, you know, he's an incredible artist. But it's still nervous, you know, it still makes you nervous to, to go on that journey with this artist. And so we did, I did all the things that they asked me to do. There's a Dropbox folder and I'm like dumping, I found a couch in Tulum and I'm like, I really like the texture of this couch. And I found this, you know, <laughs> a piece of art and I'm like, I really like this color green. And I'm just putting things in this folder to try to give the artist an idea of who I am and, and mm. where my mind is. And... When he sent me the cover, first of all, the image, I got back, again, crying, emotional. It's perfect. It's exactly what I wanted the cover to look like. It captures, I think, so much about what the book is. And then when I opened the, the box and I feel the texture, I'm like, mind blown again, because it takes it to a whole new level. So we had talked a little bit about texture and color and all those things. But honestly, that is, that's Rex's work. It's his art. And, and I'm so, so grateful for all he poured into it. And to me, you know, that what's so nice about it is the book is object because a lot of people, you know, for all kinds of reasons, like not only do I have your book, but I also have the audible because it helps me to hear the author read. Sure. But some people are going to always read on a Kindle. But if you're someone who actually gets the book, it's nice to have it be an object that is ta that has sensations. So now we actually have to open the book, though, and, and, and talk <laughs> about the, the, the hard parts. And I think it's really hard to write a memoir no matter what. Sure. And, um, you know, you bear your soul in some of the most painful moments of your life here. Yeah. And that's out there. And I wonder, um, you know, the courage it took uh, to do all of this for you because you, you know, you, you structure the book and, you know, the, there's a before, then the next part is a world upside down and then there's overcoming, but it's not like the before was a picnic. Right. True. Very much so. I think it, it was hard. I mean, this is a hard book to write. I knew it was going to be challenging. Maybe that's why it took me so long to decide to finally put these words on paper, but it's also a necessary book. It's a necessary journey. It's an important story to tell, not just for me, but for so many people like me. Um, I, I spent from 2016 to 2020, I spent that four years-ish convincing myself that it was not time to write a book. Every time someone would ask me, are you going to write down your experiences? I would have a new reason why it wasn't yet time to write this mm -hmm. book. And then as I talk about sort of midway through, the murder of George Floyd became this really important inflection point for me 
about the intersections of my identity that, you know, I'm a person who has not only experienced intense anti-LGBTQ, you know, violence and hate, but I've also experienced a lot of racism in my life. And there are people out there like me who are young and feel like maybe they're the only person living at the intersections of those identities that that no one really understands them. And so watching the pain and grief across the country after George Floyd was murdered, it became clear to me that I needed to write down the honest truth about what it feels like to stand at those two intersecting roads, to feel sometimes lost in that intersection, to feel like you don't really belong to any one particular identity because you have different ones that you're constantly pulling at. Um, so that was really what compelled me to write it and also gave me the strength to get through some of the hardest parts of the book. There are stories I've told a million times before. I tell people that the Pulse chapter is probably, honestly, one of the easiest ones for me to write because I've told it so many times that I knew from the beginning exactly how I wanted it to sound. But there are others that are not so easy. I, I talk about a sexual assault experience that I had. That's actually a story I've never told before publicly. And, and very specifically, I never told my family, my parents or my grandparents, and I knew they would read it. And so I struggled a lot with how they would perceive it. You know, would they think less of me? Would they, what would they think of me after reading that part? So, so many of these stories were difficult to write through. Um, it's a difficult journey to tell but I just knew it was necessary, not, not just for me to heal, but for so many other people who need to know that, that there are more of them uh, out there in the world. And I'm so grateful that you did that. I, like so many others, um, am a victim of sexual assault. And like your scenario, there was drinking involved. And I mm. see, you know, it's not your fault. And yet I see in the way you write it, the way you lead up to that evening, you know, you're, 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 you're writing in it things like, I should have seen this red flag, you know, right. and you're saying that and it's like, gosh, have you, have you, is that how you still think about it? Or is that how you, in other words, how can you let go? You know, it, it was not your fault. This, this right. guy was a complete predator. It wasn't just you. I'm sh you know, based on the way you write that scene, someone said, don't trust him. I mean, all of it, it, I'm so sorry it happened to you, I guess is what I'm saying. Thank you. I appreciate that. I, I feel like my favorite chapter of the book is titled Forgiveness. And it's, you know, it's an exploration of not just forgiving others, but forgiving ourselves. And while I, you know, I wrote the story of Ben, who is the, the person who assaulted me, I, in a way that I think really gives voice to the way people feel, the way victims of sex, sexual assault feel, um, how they feel, uh, at least for me, I felt hopeless. I felt out of control of the situation and at the same time responsible. Like I had, you know, it was what I deserved. And that was compounded with this idea that as a gay man, that I couldn't have healthy sexual relationships, that I couldn't have healthy romantic relationships with men. And that's sort of what I wanted to capture with that story is these compounding ideas of, you know, you've just survived something horrific and you're dealing with the trauma of surviving sexual assault and the societal expectations that maybe you deserve it because you're a deviant, because you're part of a sexual minority. Um, but I also feel like, you know, where I am today is, is a much better place of understanding around, you know, that it isn't my fault, that I didn't deserve it, that I didn't ask for it, that, you know, choosing to go and hang out with a group of people on New Year's Eve didn't, um, doesn't justify what someone did to me. And that's why for me, the, the forgiveness chapter is so important because while it's about a couple of stories and moments where I've, I've learned to forgive myself, that applies to all of the other moments in the book, right? It applies to the way that I never really learned to process losing my mom. It, right. it you know, applies to that sexual assault moment. I think that forgiveness chapter for me is a, a reflection back on all of those moments and learning to say out loud, you, you're not responsible for those things and you deserve to be here. You do. And, and I think that last sentence, you deserve to be here. You could have said the words, I deserve to be here. Yeah. And you do. And that's, yeah. I think, a lot of the survivor's guilt that you admit. I mean, I don't, say, I don't know if you say those exact words um, so hard. Uh, to, there, there are so many moments when I was reading 
where, I, I mean, I almost <laughs> broke down crying, but I think um, your relationship with your father, mm. um, both at the beginning and the end of the book, um, especially in light of your mother's early tragic death and your father, I think, evolving. Um, yeah, absolutely evolving. Uh, it just, in the, in the way... I don't know. How, am I allowed to say stuff that happens in the book? Or is it? Should I not? Give, yeah, no. We can give things can, a little spoiler alert. <laughs> okay, little spoiler alert. But um, when you're in the car and he says, "Son, take me to Pulse," I, I was just like buckets. I, how did you? <laughs> how did you even not just start weeping when he when he said that in the car? Yeah, I maybe I was in shock. I'm not sure and. You know, I was sort of in work mode at the time, right? That moment comes right after I've just done this long interview. And it was, I mean, it was long. We were there for a long time. And so I feel like I was like in the zone. I'm in work mode. And he asked me, and it just took me so by surprise that I didn't know how to respond. And then I immediately thought, you have to just say yes and figure out how to get there because he may change his mind in five minutes. So you better just find a way to make this happen. Um, but for me, the, the story of my dad is, was a really important one to tell. Um, first of all, because he and I have never really talked through that arc before. I mean, we, you know, we have our moments, obviously, that we talk about in the book that, you know, that we have this sort of redemption story together. I think that's pretty beautiful. But we've not ever sat down and detailed that, right? We've not ever sat down and talked about childhood and and rehashed all of those moments. It's just sort of an unspoken arc mm -hmm. between the two of us. I think men of that era have a hard time. I would imagine <laughs> my dad would have a very hard time sitting down <laughs> and talking about it. But I do think, you know, again, that like that moment where he's vulnerable and asks to go and see something that will be painful for the two of us was one of the most necessary parts of the book because I wanted the book not just to serve as a mirror for queer people and specifically queer people of color, I wanted it to serve as a window for people who might not understand our community, for people who know what it feels like not to belong or you know to struggle to fit in, but don't understand or even accept or acknowledge what it means to be queer in this country or in society in general. I wanted the book to be a window for people like my dad. And one of my favorite reviews I should not read the reviews like I do, but I'm like obsessively, <laughs> constantly it's, reading the reviews. Do you know reviews. what? Read them if you want to. <laughs> I really, I just, I want to know what people think. I'm so touched by the things that resonate with people, especially the comments about my best friends. But there was one particular Amazon reviewer who started by saying, I don't normally read memoir, uh, and I'm not sure what drew me to your book, but perhaps it is the fact that I'm the mother of a trans son that I'm struggling to accept and support. And that's what I want the book to be as much as I want it to be a mirror for queer people who are struggling to find somewhere to belong in the world. That's so interesting. I hadn't thought about that helping. I mean, it's, it's your story, obviously, but that helping. And I think it, it, that maybe there are readers who would identify in that way. I think the, um, the now that we've talked about the redemption moment, early on um, when you were in high school, um, I'm, I'm, I hope that you're proud of the young person you were. I mean, the, when there was that, that group that was like a white supremacist group at your high school. Right. Can you talk a little bit about how you took that on? But, and then also your father's reaction? Because I think to me that was, um, in my house, if my kids did something like that, I'd just be like, this is, I'm so proud of you. That's not exactly yeah. the reaction you got at That's all. That's not the reaction I got, um, which is not surprising. My dad, uh, I don't know that he knows those words, I am proud of you, but he thinks them. I can see it on his face when he's thinking them. Um, <laughs> yeah, so when I was in high school, my senior year of high school was um, was a mess. I mean, it was a mess from the very beginning. this is beginning. Ba back in Oregon, right? This is back in Oregon. This is 2005, 2006. So if it gives you an idea of the political climate, like the year before that, Oregon banned same-sex marriage by constitutional amendment. Oregon's also a deeply troubled state in terms of issues with racism. People think Portland and they have this idea, but the truth is Oregon has a, uh, a you know, a really long history with racism. Uh, in many ways, it was the seat of KKK power in the West. Uh, and so that sort of 
vein was always there. I grew up in a really little cow town and, and those things were always sort of simmering underneath the surface, right? But um, senior year, we started the year off thinking this is going to be it. We're going to like go out with a bang. And right off the bat, a friend discovers that there's a white supremacist cell operating in our school. And they had, you know, coded their MySpace pages so they could all tell who each other was. And they would meet after uh, after sports games, specifically basketball games, uh, to gang up on, you know, visiting teams who were majority kids of color. Like, it was really brutal stuff, especially when you consider it's 2005, 2006. And um, the way they got caught was they made a hit list and they posted it to their MySpace group. And our folks, my friend, uh, discovered it and, you know, brought it to our attention, alerted the principal and, and the administrative staff who basically shrugged it off and said, you know, Can I just oh, back up for one sec? Yeah. So just some clarify some points. Weren't you like sure. student body president too? Yeah, I had just been elected the... The previous spring, I'd been elected student body president. It was my term. I was, you know, just a couple of weeks in. And the rest of our student body office group were largely queer, and many of them were people of color. So you have a leader, you're, you've already, you're already a, you're not just a random kid in high school. You're, right. you do, grades are great. You're student body president. So you're chosen by the other students and you approach the administration, like the principal's office. Is that who it was that you told or? Yeah, that's About right. This. So we as a group approached the principal's office. We actually printed off the MySpace group. We're like, you know, early 2000s. We're still using printers and we've got MySpace pages. But we printed off the group's <laughs> page and showed them, these are the things they're saying. And by the way, this the, the top post on this page says, these are the people I wish were dead. And it's, you know, our classmates and us included, we think you should do something about this. We can identify who these students are. And essentially the administration was like, well, boys will be boys, you know, just ignore it and it will go away. And that was insufficient. I mean, it was, first of all, it was deeply hurtful because these, these kids are talking about acts of violence against us. Um, and even I, I'm sitting here, not just as a human who realizes this is a huge problem, but like as a lawyer, what were right. they thinking? But anyway. I have, yeah. I mean, you know, we're like in a little cow town again. The administration was largely made up of people who graduated from the school, went to college, came back to their hometown. Like, it's all of the, the sort of small town story. And that just wasn't good enough for us. So my friend called me that night and she said, I have a plan. And she sent that MySpace group information to every news outlet she could find. She, you know, sourced all of the different newsrooms and all no. of that. And they showed up. They showed up at our school. Um, news trucks were outside. And I remember what a huge scene it caused. And you could tell you felt the administration frustrated with us. But, you know, what are they going to say or do at that time? It, it By then it's blown up. So... All of that led to expulsions and suspensions, and but that was the beginning of our senior year of high school. And then, you know, I won't give the whole book away, but the end of senior year didn't end up very much better than that. So it was really, you know, a high school experience that was fraught with racism, with homophobia. It was all the things. And when I, you know, was around the kitchen dinner table uh, with with my dad later that day, um, we had a rule where where all the kids were expected to be around the dinner table to sit. There was no TV. There were no, well, cell phones weren't really popular at that time, but it was time for, for the family to be together. And I sat down and we went around the table to talk about our days and I mentioned what had happened. And my dad's immediate response was, well, maybe these people have a point, you know, talking about this group of students in the school. And let me just, what I realize that folks may not know is that your father is white. Yeah, he is. Yeah, my, he's white. And he says that to you. His yeah. son, right. maybe they have a point. Right. And it was... I can't even imagine. It was jarring because, you know, he, his mind immediately goes to the tough guy, like, you know, pull yourself up by the bootstraps, men don't cry, that sort of, like, that energy. And I think his reaction is to get frustrated when people are feeling emotional or going through processing something. And, and that was... And his natural reaction was to snap at that part of it. But the fact that it was then laced with this, uh, you know, apologist nature for these racist, violent people that were in school, it made me feel really alone. And so I wrote in the book, you know, how isolated I felt. I felt, you know, really viscerally in that moment 
like I was on my own. That no matter what happened in my life, no matter what came from that moment or beyond, I was going to have to figure it out on my own. And you can imagine for a 17-year-old kid, that's that's pretty hard to go through when you're thinking about you know what that means for for graduation, for college, for your adult life. You really feel like you're going to have to do it all by yourself. I, I it's terrifying, right? It feels like there's no safety net, there's no margin for error. But then it turns out, I think the greatest lesson that uh, your friend Drew taught you was that you're not, that you're a community. Right. I mean, to me, I, what a, what a, the story of your relationship, um, the, the different times when you had fallings out and when he helped bring things together. It's, it's, it's lovely to have a friend like that. C- can you talk a little bit about that relationship? Yeah. You know, when we built the proposal for this book, as I mentioned, there were some things that I already knew from the time we sat down and said, I think it's time to write a book. We already knew that they would be stories in the pages. We already knew who the characters would be. And I knew from the beginning that there would be a a chapter titled Drew. I just knew that he needed that much space in this book for people to really understand the impact that he had on me. And again, as you think about the book as a window into you know your own life and experiences and the people around you, I wanted people for a moment to stop and consider who might be the Drew in their own lives. Uh, and part of, I think, what makes Drew's story so profound is that it's marked by a whole bunch of things that seem mundane on the surface. Every one of the stories that you know, that I mentioned in the book about Drew are things that happen all the time, you know, getting in an argument at a club and going on vacation together. And they're just seemingly normal moments that friends have, but put in their totality, the collection of those stories paint a really beautiful picture of someone who fundamentally changed my life, someone who taught me for the first time that it's okay to love yourself exactly as you are, someone who showed me the path toward, you know, that that grace and compassion that we show other people. Um, Drew gave me all of that. He really gifted me as not just a best friend, but really a brother. He gifted me the idea of what unconditional love can truly look and feel like. And I knew that I would need a whole chapter, if not more, to capture all of that beauty um, so that people could, could feel it for just a moment. One of the things that I learned after the shooting at Pulse was that you go through a range of emotions when you lose someone like that, right? You go through anger and certainly sadness and grief. But one of the um, emotions that I least expected was fear. And, you know, there's, there's a part of you that's afraid you're going to forget someone like Drew. And so you save old voicemails so you remember how they sounded when they picked up the phone. You save old T-shirts so you remember how they smelled when they walked in the room. But I was really afraid that that they would be forgotten, that Drew and his partner Juan would just be names on a wall somewhere, that, you know, they would be memorialized only for how they died and not how they lived. And, and I wanted to set out to make sure that didn't happen. I wanted people to even just for a few pages know them as I knew them. And that's why it was so important for me to, to leave so much space for them in this book. I love that because I really do... I do. I get the sense that I that I know Drew a little bit better than Juan, but he was also later into your life, and right. I like that you described him as that you kind of knew that there was something going on because Drew said, "Yeah, there was this guy just following us around." Yeah, that and was you're not like, real. "Oh, <laughs> I knew." Yeah. As soon as he dropped it in conversation, <laughs> I was like, "Oh, that's a breadcrumb. I'm just gonna pick that up and save it for later." <laughs> and are you? Um, have you, is his family, have you connected with his extended family that you might not have known before? Uh, briefly, I uh, obviously built a connection with Drew's mom. Um, that was, you know, she's the person who's closest to him. Uh, he really grew up uh, an only child with her as a single parent. And so um, we got close immediately after the shooting. She actually texted me on the day that the book came out to congratulate me. Oh, I love um, that. So, yeah, so that's really sweet. His extended family is, they were always, um, I, I, they always had a challenging relationship with him too. And, you know, I know he loved his dad, but had a complicated relationship with him. They bonded over movies, I think. Um, and ha- he had some distance between other family members. So we've had a chance to connect, certainly at his funeral service. But 
outside of that, um, the person that he really, I mean, was bonded most closely with is his mom. And, and she continues to carry on his legacy, I think, really beautifully. That's lovely. Um, I want to ask you about the, the, at the start of the book, there's this author's note. And I've noticed that I've seen something similar in the memoirs I've read, where you kind of say, you know, you say it beautifully, but the bottom line is, I did my best to remember things as they were. And, right. you know, this is my point of view. And sorry if I got things wrong. And I've changed, you know, I've invented some dialogue to re- or recreated some, and I've changed some names. Is that something you wanted to say? Or did they tell you you have to say that? Uh, well, the lawyers definitely want that part in the front of the book. <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> and, uh, and I also want to be honest, because there are people in this book who, you know, I don't always paint in the friendliest of light. And, you know, I wanted folks to know that those names may have been changed in case, you know, just to protect people's dignity. Did you change a lot of them. names in here? I changed or just... quite a few names. Yeah. Early, it's, it's funny because earlier we were, um, we were reminiscing about that high school story and I realized that's one of the names I changed. So I caught myself before I just exposed exactly oh, who that person is. <laughs> I'm so glad because I, I was wondering why you weren't saying that person's name and I was about to say, who are you talking about? And I was like, I was literally flipping through the book Thumbing trying to see. The book. Yeah, I was yeah, trying yeah. to remember which identity I chose for that person to protect oh, their. Do you have a little code? You should have your code sheet just so I you. do. I, it's in an email with my, uh, with my <laughs> publishing team, who I, which names I selected for who. That's so difficult. Um, Did that make you feel more free? I forget the lawyer's stuff, but in terms of um, just telling your story without worrying about hurting people, does that help? Is that one reason why to to do that? It helps a little bit. I would say, first of all, I committed to being very honest and very vulnerable. Um, I've read memoirs, um, mostly from politicians, because I know, you know, politicians love to put out a memoir right before they run for office. Um, and they all kind of feel the same to me. Like they're a little varnished and you can tell they've been through a couple consulting firms to make sure they've been scrubbed of all the like messy parts. And it just doesn't (laughs) feel authentic to me. Right. And I wanted this book to resonate with people in a really authentic way. So the first thing that gave me comfort was just committing to being honest. And I was like, I'm going to be hundred percent honest about what I experienced. And somebody else's perspective may be different on that, but this is just how I lived it. Um, I think changing names certainly helped. I think, you know, relinquishing this idea that I might remember every single detail perfectly also helped. And uh, I read The Art of Memoir right as I was getting ready to, to write this book. One of the things the author says is, if people wanted you to write nicer things about them, they should have behaved better. And I actually printed that and put it above my writing space because I felt like, I'm just going to hold on to that for the moments when I feel uncomfortable about what I'm about to write. <laughs> oh boy! Um, and then, the, and then the truth is, if I, you know, if you're writing your memoir, if you didn't want to write the bad stuff about yourself, you, maybe you should have behaved better. That's right. Um, and I, and, and again, uh, I, you in do, total you do. honesty, <laughs> I was honest about moments when I'm not really a great person either. I love that you did that. The, the, the story that you tell. Um, about your freshman year at college. That's a really hard story to tell. We've all had moments like that where we're feeling insecure and so we become the bully. Um, It's not nice. And uh, I I was talking to someone once on this podcast and I said, well, haven't you done something like that? And they're like, never. I'm like, oh. That's a lie. (laughs) That's a lie. We, I mean, I I feel, well, and forgive me for the person who's (laughs) now listening. (laughs) I don't remember who it was. I honestly don't remember who it was, but I confess to some bullying I did. I I just don't remember, which I'll have to go back and maybe someone's listening now and can send me an email. They're going to send you an email. Well, I think, (laughs) you know, I I say that so quickly because uh, it is not truthful to say that we've never hurt anyone. I mean, we are human beings. Oh, well, that's what I said to them. You've had to hurt someone. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. I mean, we... We're human beings, right? Our, our relationships are complicated. Emotions are messy. We sometimes do things we're not proud of. And and again, I wanted to be really honest and vulnerable in this book. And there are moments where I have been someone I don't recognize. And there are a lot of reasons that I got there. None of them are excuses for how I treated anyone. But I didn't want to paint this book like I was some you know victim on planet Earth and everything happens to poor little me. There are moments that I did, you know, ugly things that that hurt people. And I, you know, was difficult in relationships when I didn't need to be. And I wanted to be honest about that, too. So, you know, it's funny, like in this book, I know there are a lot of 
you know, they're good people, they're awful people. And there's someone who just just annoyed me in the book um, who shouldn't have annoyed me that you include it. Okay, Okay. it bothers me. Okay, so when you're in the the, um, afterward, I think this is where it is. Oh, yeah, Uh uh-huh, Elena. You're like... Yeah, the woman at the bar. Why <laughs> yeah. don't you give her the time of day? She doesn't. She doesn't deserve a place in your book. <laughs> I. You know what's so funny about her is I was actually deeply annoyed by her in the moment. Uh, and do you want to tell? Do you want to say what that was about now? Yeah. It's just so, the, so in the afterward, for folks who read, you'll notice I give some space to Elena in this book. Um, Elena is a woman that I met. I told you I. Took six to eight weeks off. I moved to Mexico to write this book. I'm in Mexico at a bar. I'm so proud of myself because I've like met my word count goal and I'm I'm doing well, right? <laughs> and so I go to this place um, that I really love. It's this like, it's actually a pizza restaurant, but you can get other things. So it's like a pizza shop and there's almost never any space in there. There's like four tables. And so I'm walking by and I see this spot is open at the bar and I'm like, it's calling to me. I have to do this. So I go into my favorite little pizza shop and I sit down and there's this woman who is clearly a little intoxicated, very loud. She has, you know, like got main character syndrome all over this restaurant. She knows all the bartenders. She's, you know, whatever. She's like visiting from Sonoma County and she has a home here. It's a whole lot of stuff, right? And, um, she starts up, tries to start up a conversation and I'm ignoring her because I'm annoyed and I'm, as you'll find in the book, also deeply introverted. And I don't love that small talk thing, right? And so I'm like on my phone trying to act busy while my phone dies. So now I'm like stuck in this moment. So I finally engage in conversation with her and we start talking about what brings us to Mexico. And I mentioned that I'm writing a book, which I was very nervous to do because it's a vulnerable thing. And you know, it opens you up to a whole conversation about what's the book about and all that. So, of course, she launches into her questions and she lets me talk about the book. And she finally gets to this place where she's like, okay, so you have a lot of trauma and that's fine and all, but why why write a book? Why does that matter to me? Why does your trauma make any difference to me? I don't like her. (laughs) And I was... I mean, I, I know everything has to have a so what, like why would people care? I know that's the idea, but you already have the damn book contract. You should just fuck all the way off. I, I hate her. Yeah, well, I had a, an immediate moment of like, first of all, rage, because I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> this is so hard. And I'm like pouring my soul into writing this book. And then I also had a moment of like imposter syndrome, right? Because I'm like, wow, why me? Why did I write a book? Do I even know why I wrote a book? Do, is anyone going to care? Maybe she's like a sliver of the people that will pick up the book and read it and be like, ugh, why is this guy writing a book? So I went through all of those things in a very short amount of time. And then, um, you know, we finished up our conversation. I paid my bill. I went back to my Airbnb and I started writing. And I wrote the story of Elena because actually on the way home, as I pondered, why me, why this book? My realization was that the answer is, there is no particular reason that it's me that has to answer these questions. My story is unique in some ways and not unique in other ways, but that's the point. Our stories are worth telling. That my story as a queer black person in America, a survivor of gun violence, a survivor of sexual assault, a person who's struggled to find a place to belong, that story needs to be told. And I didn't write it because I have all the answers. I wrote it because I want you to know I'm asking the questions too. You know, now I'm so glad you included Elena. (laughs) <laughs> it's very clever of you because she makes you angry, but then she makes you think. Right, exactly. The way you did. And it made me think because I was like, I'm someone who, who who loves to read and I'm very open to people's stories. And so that I, it, as you're talking about it, it's like, yeah, I, as I'm now rethinking and your, the redemption story, though, matters. I mean, I think it. Ma- I want to read your story. I'm interested in you because I, I like what you're doing politically. I know who you are just from our various um, Twitter DM groups, which I haven't been on because I've quit Twitter, at yeah, least for good. now, once it's again. Better once, your, it's better for your mental health. <laughs> yeah, but now I'm on threads, so it's just the same, Maybe same it's thing. The same. It's, yeah, it's without methadone. the annoying blue checks <laughs> at the top of your mentions. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, they still have those. Um, so, but anyway, the point is that, um, yeah, I, I am as annoying as she is, I'm, I'm glad that you also diffused her. Yeah. In other words, whether she was trolling or whether she was being helpful or not, if it's something that's going to, 
strike a nerve, why not put that right there? And I and I'm glad I'm glad that you did. That's so, that shows a lot of courage too. Thank you. That you way, know, but I I still hate her. Yeah, that's okay. You can. I don't have a <laughs> I don't have a deep sense of feeling about her one it's way like or the other. It's like my maternal thing. It's like back yeah. off, Elena. Leave the kid alone. Was she older than you? Was she she older yeah, than you? she was probably in her fifties. I would imagine. Yeah, and she should have been more maternal, a good mother, not a bad mother like she was. She was very. She was on her own journey. She, you know, she told me her life story too, um, to which I did not respond. Why do I care? Uh, but. I notably. Think, <laughs> notably, I did not respond that way. Um, but I do think one of the things I tried to do in the book, and Elaine is an example of that, my dad is an example of that, is to make clear that even the people we think we disagree with the most, even the people who feel like in that moment there's no way we could find common ground or maybe they're unintentionally or intentionally hurtful to us, that they too have moments of redemption, that you know, an offer of grace can sometimes allow us to see them from a new perspective. And as I mentioned in the forgiveness chapter, forgiveness, forgiving people um, and offering grace is not about absolving them of the harm they've done. It's about lifting that weight from your own shoulders. It's about you know, removing the cloud of what has been so you can see what can be. And for me, Elena and my dad are examples of like, <laughs> these are people that, are not always kind and I don't always agree with, but at the end of the day, they have their own redemption because they either made me think or because we found a, a different ending that I might have imagined possible. Also, um, giving her a little grace, what she's also saying is, I've had trauma, she's saying, I've had pain, and yeah. who's going to listen to me is what that's she's right. saying. You know, that's and right. that's that's hearing her and giving her that space is actually kind of kind of you. After Pulse, you kind of threw yourself into a, a, a lot of work, a lot of advocacy yeah. around gun violence. Right now, you're at Equality Florida, yep. head of communications, I think. Uh, I'm the press secretary for the press secretary. Yeah. And uh, t t tell me a little bit about about the work, wh how you landed there, and what is the important work you're doing? Because Florida needs help right now. Florida is a mess right now, and it really, you know, what I what I think is is hard to say out loud um, is that it's probably worse than most people think when they're not in the state of Florida, right? You hear snippets or see little headlines here and there. And the truth is that it it's worse for a lot of people than you think it is. The culmination of all these policies and the political rhetoric and the climate down here, it, it's really quite terrifying for uh, LGBTQ people and very specifically for transgender people. So, you know, after Pulse, I, I felt angry. I felt frustrated at a world that had let us down. I felt frustrated at a politics that was so focused on squeezing everything through the cheesecloth of an election cycle without actually offering any real solutions. I was deeply frustrated that every face I saw talking about our tragedy looked different from mine, that they were all mm. of these people who, it was like a spectator sport for them. Like they were talking about how our you know, loss might play between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton and whose tweets were more offensive. And and at the same time, there was no conversation with, you know, people who had been directly impacted sitting at that table talking about all of the things that we needed, the support and resources we needed. And so I started to dive in. And, and you know, I say that politics in many ways is like the matrix. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. Once you see, first of all, that it is one very long episode of Veep that never seems to end. You can't unsee <laughs> that part of it. And once you see the impact that politics has on everyone's lives, you can't unsee that either. And so as I got deeper into the weeds, the, you know, the more I wanted to pull people in with me and educate them on how to be involved in the process. So I started volunteering here and there. I did some work with gun violence prevention organizations have gotten in the, in the opportunity to do a lot of really cool and interesting things. But in 2019, I left my career in the corporate world at Starbucks and uh, went to work for Equality Florida on the comms team. 
And we just, we fight. I mean, every single day for us is about building collective power because there will come a day when the pendulum swings back and we have to be ready um, to move it in the direction of freedom. My job each and every day is largely When to is help. that day coming? I, you know what? I wish I knew. <laughs> okay. I, I wish I knew, I, but it's coming. Okay. It is coming. Okay. <laughs> it's coming, I Sorry. promise. I, you know, I think the... The thing that I'm most humbled and honored to be able to do every day is, number one, to help shape the conversation. If Mm -hmm. people like Ron DeSantis had their way, they would have you believe that they're champions of parental rights, that Florida is the freest state in the nation, and that everything's hunky-dory down here. And it's my job to to, to tell the truth to be honest about what's happening and to make sure that everywhere someone like Ron DeSantis goes, he is saddled with all of the hate and bigotry that he has dumped into this state. That everywhere he goes, people know that's he, right. Do he it. is yep. fueled by anti-LGBTQ animus. So that's number one. And number two is I get the, uh, the distinct honor of making sure that anytime we're being talked about, that we're in the conversation. I get to teach people how to share their stories. I get to position directly impacted people to to be voices and advocates. I get to help write speeches and press releases and all the things. And, And that for me, that's the best part is watching people in the community find their voice, step up to the stage, be heard, watch people respond to them, and then let that feed other people who wanna share their story and be heard for the first time too. It's great that you're empowering people that way and letting them be seen and heard. Um, Is there a way we can help Equality Florida? Is there a way to contribute or support their efforts, your efforts? Yeah, I would say, you know, number one, of course, we would love if you want to give of your time or your treasure, you can go to equalityflorida.org and we've got ways to do that. You can get our volunteer newsletter if you want to, you know, there are always digital actions. You can send emails, make phone calls, send text messages. If you're not in the state, you can do on the ground work. Certainly we would love if your treasure is the way you want to give, we'll take (laughs) a donation too. But I also want to challenge people to do a couple of things that I think you can do outside of Equality Florida, just in your regular life. The first one is to be courageously curious about the world around you. And what I mean when I say that is, it's really easy to be curious about the things that confirm your own biases. It's really easy to be curious about the things that you think you already understand or know or are comfortable with. It's hard to be curious about the things that make you uncomfortable, mm-hmm. the things that question you know, or, or challenge your vision of the status quo. Lean into those things. Be courageously curious. If you're hearing, you know, right-wing talking points about healthcare for trans kids, for instance, and you feel like they're vibing with, yeah, okay, that makes sense to me, right? Yeah, I don't want that to happen to children. You got to ask questions. You have to be courageously right, curious. Because that's, that's, they're not telling the truth about, yeah. they're making it sound like adults are driving these decisions when it's actually kids. Yeah, I, you've got to interrogate yeah. those things, right? Yeah. Because- there is, a, there is a good chance that if you hear it and it immediately vibes with all of your biases, that it is biased in nature and you have to go out and seek good information to be knowledgeable about the world around you. So be courageously curious. And you know the other thing that I would challenge people to do is to lean into accompliceship, not just allyship. It's one thing to. What is that? Know, I like that 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 word, accompliceship. Accompliceship. Al- what is allies, that? Allies are there when it's easy. Allies are there when the photo ops happen. Allies will put up a pride display at the front of the store, but then at the first sign of trouble, they take it down, right? Allies are... I see you, Target. I see you, Target. I don't want to name names, but Target. Uh, <laughs> allies are very often the, you know, they're, they're there and they're there when we need them there. They're a support structure. But when the going gets tough, it's accomplices that are willing to stand on the front lines with you. It's accomplices that are willing to shake the table, that are willing to challenge the status quo, that are willing to stop a dialogue, a conversation and say, there is a voice that's missing here and I don't want to go on until we get them at this table, those are your accomplices. Those are the people who are are going to be there to bail you out <laughs> when you get arrested at a protest, right? We need those accomplices at this moment, and we all have to choose to, to, to be accomplices in this moment, right? That means getting uncomfortable. That means, again, challenging the status quo. It means putting our own privilege on the line when it makes sense. Um, it's not easy, 
it's uncomfortable, but it's required in this moment. So choose to be accomplices, not just allies. Thank you so much for your leadership and your voice. Is there anything I forgot to ask you, Brandon? Oh my gosh, I don't, I don't think so. Thank you so much for reading the book. Thank you. I'm <laughs> glad that it resonates with you. I am so honored to have had the opportunity to share it. And, and my only requirement for people, now you know I read the reviews, is that if you read it, please let me know what you think. Oh, I will go on Amazon and do that. Or, is that, or wherever. That's wherever, the only place. Wherever. Yeah, wherever. Goodreads, Amazon, wherever you like. I'll go all the places. Thanks. Loved it. Um, so one last thing. How do people find you if they want to? I mean, obviously, they can find the book wherever books are sold. But how do they find more of your writing or more from your advocacy? Yeah, I, you know, connect with me on social media. I think Instagram is where I put a lot of like video content. If you're into that, you can find me at Brandon J. Wolf on Instagram. I'm also on threads at Brandon J. Wolf. Uh, and I am still on Twitter, unfortunately, for better or worse. I'm yeah. at B. Joe Wolf on Twitter. I can't promise I'll read the mentions there because I don't feel like scrolling past Elon's bot army to get there. But um, yeah, we can connect there as well. Just let's stay connected. I'd love to engage in conversation. We're truly in this work together. That is maybe one of the most important themes of A Place for Us is that the places for us are not just physical. They're not just places like Pulse Nightclub or you know the dinner table where we eat together. They are the communities we build. They're the relationships we form. So it's going to take those relationships and that community in this moment to move the country forward. Well said. Thank you. I really love Brandon, but I still hate Elena. I can't help it. I, I, I did try to say that's good and I'm trying to give her some grace, but it just, it just sticks with me. It just sticks with me that I, I'm imagining he's sitting at this pizza restaurant at the bar speaking to this stranger. And if he's told her what he's writing about, then he's told her that he's a survivor of this terrible gun violence where he lost his closest friends. And then she has to say to him, yeah, so you've been through a lot. Why does anyone care? I mean, what's wrong with that woman? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, so whatever. I hope that's not her real name. But if it is Elena, Elena, get your shit together um, and don't be so mean. Uh, and... Um, the other thing I wanted to say is, one thing I forgot to ask Brandon about is his, his journey from Oregon to Orlando, but he covers that in detail at the book. Uh, he worked for Disney, and that was a really interesting experience. And again, I encourage you to read A Place for Us. It's incredibly well-written, poignant, and it takes you through a very sweet redemption story between a father and son. And I will be back next week with another show as we continue to explore the writing process and the nonfiction world together. Let us know what you think. Send an email to bookedup at politicon.com. You can also write to Booked Up at PO Box 147, Northampton, Massachusetts, 01061. To keep up with the show and our featured authors, follow Booked Up on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And please give Booked Up a five-star review. It really will help other people find the podcast.